Okay, so we are ready for the full review for our um, government test that is tomorrow. I have with me my spiral. So you should have your spiral with you. Um, I have my index card. So you should have your index card of notes. I also have some blank paper in case you want to take any notes. And our main uh, tool we're going to be using today is this checklist. I went through and I made a list of all the potential topics on the test. We're going to pick a topic. I'll run through a couple things, show you some strategies and some notes. You're going to be keeping a hand of your index card so you can kind of just check and make sure you've got every topic on your index card for you to use. All right. So we're going to get started. I am going to say I have to be off at 7.30. So we're going to keep this pretty tight. Um, we're going to use this checklist. And we're just going to go through. And once something's checked off, we're not going to double back to it unless the question addresses something I have not talked about. Okay. Um, it shouldn't ask for a Quizlet code. Let me look up the... Quizlet link really quickly, and I will copy and paste the link. It's not set to private or anything, so it shouldn't. Principal of the government. Do any of that. There, I have posted the link in the live chat. If you are trying to watch this later, there is a Quizlet. The title of the Quizlet is Seven Principles of Government. And it is under the created by the user Amy underscore Foster Munoz. So make sure you're looking for the one made by that user because there's a bunch of them out there. Okay. Um, Okay, Aveline, we will get to that in just a little bit. We're going to kind of stop at the top and work our way down, okay? So everybody, we are going to start with the Articles of Confederation and Shay's Rebellion. So remember our Articles of Confederation? We talked about how it was a fail. So the first strategy is that it's a fail. Before we actually even get to the hand, we want to focus on the fail of the AOC. We talked about there's three documents sort of in this story of American government. The first document in the story is the DOI, which we think of as dump the idiot. OK. So in this, we dump England. We don't set up a new relationship. All we do is dump England. OK, so DOI is dump the idiot. And then the AOC, the Articles of Confederation, is afraid of commitment. OK. Okay, Ray, and I'm not going to tell you what specific questions they're going to ask. I, I'm never going to tell you what questions are on the test. What kind of questions are they going to ask? Social studies questions about the topics on my list. So the AOC is afraid of commitment. Okay. Um, and that's like we don't want to have too strong of a bond. We don't really want to commit all the way. We kind of just want to work together. Without, we're just going to talk. We're not going to have a real relationship. And then the United States Constitution, the one you should choose. So choose this Constitution, okay? Because that's the best one. So that's our final one. We've had a formal relationship with the United States Constitution since it was written in 1787. So talking about the Articles of Confederation, the Articles of Confederation is a fail. One, thank you. Okay, so the Articles of Confederation is a fail, and that stands for it was the first attempt in government. So after we dump the idiot, it's our first relationship after that. Okay, for the United States, it's the first attempt in government. All the power is to the states. Okay, and income is impossible to get. So like they didn't have any money. And then there was little power 
to the center, like the federal government. Remember, central, federal, national, all mean the same thing. All right. We had, so this was our acronym is FAIL. And we had our pictures. We had the F. Oh, oh sorry. There's um, the G and there's the one in the G. So like it's the first government. Okay, so first government. And then the A is really big. And strong, and the L is little and weak. So you see there's a big A and it's states and they're really big and strong and then the central is small and weak, okay? And then income, you know, with dollar sign on your eye. All right, so that was one method of remembering the Articles of Confederation. The second method we talked about was the hand, and this is the five weaknesses, okay? And there's the five weaknesses. So the first weakness was we talked about was the pinky. Remember the pinky was pink, okay? So it was a weak central government. Your pinky's kind of a weak finger. It's a weak central government, okay? And then the ring finger, when we did this like yellow for gold. Okay, so yellow for gold. And that's because there was no money because they couldn't tax. So they had no money. Okay. Yes, ring that's where, yeah. So then they had no money. So that's where you wear your ring finger that's made out of gold. So they had no money. Okay. And then, and y'all really will, yeah. So, and then this one. See, this is in the middle, so it's like the border. So we did it green, and that was our border disputes. Okay, this this state and this state are fighting over where the border is going to go. Okay, does that tree belong to Connecticut? Does that tree belong to Rhode Island? Let's fight about it. Okay, so they were arguing with each other. The states are all fighting with each other. Okay, about where the border should go. So again, weak, no money, border fights. Okay, and then we did red. I remember that's our blaming finger. So the states were blaming each other. It's your fault. It's your fault. Um, uh, Maryland would go to New York and say, oh, it's your fault because um, you're taking up all the money to be build New York City. And uh, Virginia would say, oh, it's Massachusetts's fault because they, they're really poor right now. And everybody's just blaming each other. Okay. Creeper, if you're... Cheat sheet is the, I don't know who individually you specifically are, which does affect that question. But if your cheat sheet is the exact same as my cheat sheet, um, I really, that you robbed yourself of a learning and memorization opportunity. Okay, so just make sure that it reflects a thought process on your part. Okay, and then the last one we had was um, blue, because it makes us sad. Okay, and that was because we get no respect from other countries. Okay, no respect from other countries. So once again, it's weak, no money, fighting about the border, blaming each other, and no respect. Okay, and that's the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. And we talk about this is Shay's Rebellion. The farmers are in debt. The farmers are being put in jail. The farmers strike back. And they show us that the Articles of the Confederation doesn't work. Okay, so these are the farmers. May not work because I'm not left-handed here, but. Okay. So, there's the farm, okay. Articles of Confederation. And Shay's Rebellion. It's Shay's Rebellion, he's a farmer, it's gonna knock down the AOC. Okay, so and that's really all you need to remember with Shay's Rebellion is it's a group of farmers, they're in debt, they have no money, they're being put in jail, they rise up against the government, and they show everybody that the Articles of Confederation doesn't work, it's too weak. 
So they call a big meeting, okay? So that gets us off of like, where's my checklist? Now, I will say, Creeper, if you use my checklist as like, like you just make sure that you have all these titles. And if yours looks similar to mine, I understand that. I just want to make sure you're not robbing yourself of an opportunity to practice this information. Because you need this information for more than just this set. Um, you have a DPM in a week and a half. You've got a star test at the end of the year. You can't use an index card on those. So just keep that in mind. So we just talked about the Articles of Confederation and the um, Shays Rebellion. So check mark that. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Rain is going to think about Shays Butter. Shays Butter. Shay, Shay has a better idea. Um, Shays Rebellion. Um, whatever makes whatever helps you remember it. Okay. Northwest Ordinance. Let's talk about the Northwest Ordinance for a minute. So the Northwest Ordinance is a little weird and it tends to throw kids off because it doesn't go in with the rest of the story, right? Because this is our story. The DOI, where we dump England, then our first attempt at a government, okay? An attempt at a constitution. And then we finally get the, the one you should choose, the U.S. Constitution, okay? And Northwest Ordinance doesn't seem to fit in this story. It's more like um, a side adventure that happens in this story. So, so the Northwest Ordinance is a law about the Northwest Territory. So you just have to remember an ordinance is a law and territory is land. Okay, so the ordinance is a law and territory is land. So it's a law about this land. And the law is just saying, and I don't know if you remember, we did the, this is where we did the brownies activity. Okay, and we had a tray of brownies. And I came in and I was all like, ooh, does everybody want a brownie for themselves? And you guys were all like, yes, yes, we want those brownies. And I said, well, before we can have one for ourselves, before we can make those decisions for ourselves, we have to figure out how are we going to divide this territory up? What's our process for getting there? We have to come up with a process. And so you guys told me how to cut it. You told me that there needed to be some laws. You told me that there's like rules and methods for how you should properly cut up a tray of brownies. You can't just be cutting all everywhere. It needs to be organized. Um, that one person's going to cut it. It's not going to be like everybody cuts their own piece. So we came up with a process for how we were going to do this, okay? And that's what the Northwest Ordinance is. Um, Rain, that's what the index card is for. The index card is your crutch that's going to help you, okay? Your index card is your crutch. These are just topics. Yeah, it's a big test. You can do it, though. You've been doing really good on your tests, okay? So just believe in yourself and stay with me. So here's the brownies. Remember that we cut up and it's like how they divided the land and they figured out will a territory become a state? How will a territory become a state? That's the question that this is going to answer. Well, we're going to divide it up and we're going to give them some checkpoints so that they can have self-government. They have to have 60,000 people. They have to have a governor. Um, and they have to write a constitution. The constitution is their laws. Okay. So I'm going to be honest. I'm just going to show you. The Northwest Ordinance does not take up a lot of space on this. The biggest things you need to understand about the Northwest Ordinance is it's a law about the, uh, sorry, it's a law about this land saying, how will a territory become a state? And they want to create an orderly process so that a territory can earn self-government. Because you might be thinking, well, why would a territory even want to become a state? Okay. Why would a territory even want to become a state? Um, well, they want to become a state because then they get self-government. They get um, votes in Congress. They get to make their own decisions. Okay. They want self-government. So it's the same thing as people being like, well, why would you even want to move out of your parents' house? Well, I want to make my own decisions. Okay. Why would I even want to become a state for self-government? So remember, think about all the ways I can word this. How can a territory become a state? How can an area of land earn self-government? 
how can a territory uh, create an orderly process for achieving union with the country? So these, all of those things mean the same thing, okay? But the basic idea is it's a law for this land to become a state. All right, so that is the Northwest Ordinance. I'm gonna check that off on my list. Check. So we have two topics completed. Moving on to the Constitutional Convention. And this is a big one that can cause a lot of confusion. First thing I'm gonna do is write the hot date at the top. Um, you wanna make sure that you, that's a hot date, you guys. You know that in every test so far, there has been a timeline question of some sort. Every single test has had a timeline question of some sort. So you wanna make sure that you are thinking about the timeline question. Um, we think about the story, okay? DOI, AOC, USB. This is a hot date and this is a hot date. 1776, 1787. I'm gonna add those hot dates to this little thing. Okay, so those are both Hot days. So sometimes I like to ask about those in different ways. They might say something about the breakup letter from England. They might say something about the word independence. They might say the document signed by John Hancock. Okay, then the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they might talk about Shays' Rebellion. They might talk about the Articles themselves and the United States Constitution, 1787. Okay, um, remember we had this to try to revise the Articles of Confederation. So we want to change the Articles of Confederation, we end up writing a brand new constitution, okay? Yeah, Ray, right, it's kind of the same, but um, uh, yeah, so like we got to become a country and now these little territories or areas, this land wants to have, become a state so they can sort of go in that same level of process. Um, except don't forget states still have to answer to the United States. Like the country, states don't get to turn over what the country does. So, but these are two hot dates. So that's just important for thinking about a timeline. So constitutional convention is in 1787. And this was an anchor chart that's been up in the back of the room for um, over a week now. So, Remember, it's called to revise the AOC, okay? They think, oh, look, Shay's Rebellion came. We see all these weaknesses now. It showed us all these weaknesses because those farmers were being put in jail. And so let's get together. Let's have a meeting. We're just going to change the Articles of Confederation. Let's just fix these weaknesses. But some of the people who came to the meeting didn't want to just fix this. They wanted to throw this out and start all over, completely fresh, write a brand new constitution. Okay. And so there's going to be a lot of arguments about representation. Remember, we talked about representation is how many votes you get in Congress or in the government, how many how much votes you get in Congress, which means how much power you have. Okay, so one of the main arguments is going to be about representation, which is votes and power. Some of our major people of the Constitutional Convention, James Madison. Who's going to become the father of the Constitution? And George Mason. Who's going to become the father of the Bill of Rights? Okay. And that's just sort of the basics about the convention itself. It's called to revise the AOC. It, one of the major arguments is about representation. These are two of the big guys there and there. George Washington is there, but he just sort of runs the meeting. He just is like, okay, you get to talk now. You get to talk now. Okay. Um, and they're faced with a difficult task because they want to write something that can change with time, but still works um, for the time period in which it's being written. Because they understand that the country is going to grow and change and the Constitution needs to be able to change with it. 
So they're writing this and they have a couple big arguments about representation. And the first one, and I just want to kind of show you in terms of how much space I spent on each one. So um, the information about the Constitutional Convention is in my little square. And then this is the two compromises we're going to be talking about. So note that takes up a pretty good chunk of space. So the first compromise we're going to talk about is the really big one that people get really confused about. Okay, and it is the great compromise. And we talk, taught y'all GC equals GC. The great compromise gets us Congress. Okay, or great. I'd love that you students actually turn it into great compromise, great Congress. Okay. Yeah, Rain, that'll also help you when we get the popular sovereignty because it's the same idea. So great compromise, get Congress. Okay, great compromise is how we get Congress. That's the overall overarching result is that from this argument, we are going to get the structure of government we have today. So there's two sides of the argument. The first is the Virginia plan. Okay. Let me actually do this on a separate sheet of paper. I need some more space. So the first is the Virginia plan. Okay, and the Virginia plan is large states. And they want proportional representation based on population. So states with more people should have more votes. So if I have 50,000 people and you have 10,000 people, I should get five times as many votes as you because I have five times as many people as you. Okay. And then the other plan was the New Jersey plan. Okay, and the New Jersey plan is about small states like this plan, and they want equal representation. Okay, so these are the two sides of the argument. Big states should have more votes. Everyone should have the same amount of votes. No, big states should have more. Everyone should have the same. Okay, and we did the whole m, &M exercise with this to kind of demonstrate how if one table group has four people and one table group has two people. If I give both of you t a bag with 10 M&Ms, the group that has only two people at it, they get five M&Ms each. Whereas the group that has four at it, they only get like two and a half M&Ms each. So that's why there is this argument going on. We want it to be based proportional and we want it to be equal. So they have to come up with a compromise. If you get past this argument, that's about representation. So they come up with the great compromise and the great compromise gets us Congress. And what we had you take in your spiral was that little house. And there's two parts of the house, okay? And I also like to use my football team analogy. Okay, so we're gonna have this as the why not both? Why not both? Why not have equal representation and proportional representation? So we're going to get Congress. And we're going to have the U.S. House of Representatives. I'm talking to the computer, honey. My student. Go back to daddy. Okay and the U.S. Senate, all right? So you get the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate are the two parts of Congress, okay? And the U.S. House of Representatives is based on proportional population. So there's 435 people currently in the U.S. House of Representatives, and it's based on how many population there. So Alaska has one, Texas has 36, and California's got 53. So it's a lot. And then New Jersey has equal. So 
Alaska has two, Texas has two, California has two, everybody's got the same. So these are the two halves of Congress as part of the plan, okay? Okay. Um, what happens if they break the rule? Well, they're in violation of the Constitution. They, they, I don't think there's a way for them to break the rules. Um, if a state tried to send more people than they were supposed to send, they would just be stopped by the police or the military. I don't know. No one's ever tried to do that. Everyone's just followed the rules of the Constitution so far, which is why we've had the same Constitution for from 1787 all the way to 2019. We've been served by the same Constitution for over 200 years. We're the longest running Constitution in the world. So um, that's why this is so important. Okay, Rain, let's, not, let's stay focused on, on this and then we can have a conversation later if you want to, okay? So this is the Great Compromise, okay? It's how we get Congress. And remember the Great Compromise is a question, it's an argument about representation. It's an argument about representation, okay? All right, so the second compromise that needs to be on your notes the second compromise that needs to be on your notes is the three-fifths compromise. Okay. Okay. Which is about slaves and representation. So I taught my I told my students at least that the three fifths compromise is about representation and taxes. So you think of representation as power and taxes as money. Okay, so representation and taxes. If I count, and the question is, do we count slaves when we're counting how many people live in our state? to decide how many representatives we get in the U.S. House of Representatives. Because the U.S. House of Representatives, the bigger my state, the more people I get. Okay, the more representatives I get, the more votes I have, the more power I have. So I want to count, if I'm in the South, okay, so if I count my slaves, my power is gonna go up, okay? And if I count them for taxes, then the amount of money I have is gonna go up, okay? So the North's argument, what the North wanted is we don't want the South's power to go up. So we don't want to do this, but we do want the South to pay more money. So let's say no to this and yes to this. And the South wanted this plan. Well, we want the power, but we don't want to pay the money. So basically what you're seeing is the North and the South are facing off on this question about representation and taxes and how do we count slaves? It all comes back to slaves, okay? And the compromise is instead of counting them all or nothing, we're gonna count a part of them. We're gonna count a portion of your slaves. We're gonna count a percentage of your slaves, a fraction of your slaves and that's why we get the three-fifths compromise because we're going to count three-fifths of your slaves we'll count for votes and for taxes okay this means that in the south my taxes are going to go up by three-fifths but my power is going to go up too. So in the South, I want to agree to this because even though I don't get all, I'd still rather have some than nothing. This is still going to increase my power. This is still going to help me out. Okay. So that's sort of the argument is, do we count slaves for representation and taxes? North says no and yes. South says yes and no. 
And in the end, we compromise. Let's count a portion of the slaves. Let's count a fraction of your slaves. Three-fifths of your slaves will count for representation in taxes. Okay. Let's go back to our checklist. Okay, we did the Constitutional Convention. Check. Hot date 1787. Check. James Madison, George Mason, Great Compromise, Virginia Plan, New Jersey Plan, Congress, and the Three-Fifths Compromise. So we're doing really good on our list so far here. Okay. There's half an hour left. Let's keep going. All right. So Federalists and Anti-Federalists, just to give you an idea of how much space they take up on my card. See my AOC. I managed to squeeze that down pretty small. You may not be able to get it quite so small. Um, I just want to remind you also, sorry, everybody, make sure your name appears on your index card on both sides. Okay. And remember, you turn that in after the test. So. You're not going to get to keep it and walk out of the room with it. So Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So we have, all right, going back to our story. Okay, we dumped the idiot, 1776. We fight a whole war. We win the war, but then we're afraid of commitment. So we come up with the AOC, and it's weak. But then Shays Rebellion knocks the AOC down, the farmers. Okay, farmers fight, fighting farmers. And so we write the United States Constitution in 1787, and we say, this is the one you should choose. Choose the Constitution. But there's actually two sides to that argument. Some people like the Constitution, and some people don't like the Constitution. Okay? And we call them the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Ryan, you can't color your hand before the test. I'm sorry. You can color the hand that is on your index card. That's fine. If you put a hand on your index card, you can color that. So Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Now, I told you all that my four-year-old has a shark named Shark and a bear named Bear, right? And the Federalists like the federal government and the Anti-Federalists are against it. Because they don't have very, um, <laughs> they don't have very creative ways of naming things. Okay, so the Federalists are all like, "We love the federal government. What should we call ourselves? How about the Federalists?" And the Anti-Federalists are all like, "We don't like those guys. What should we call ourselves? So let's call ourselves the Anti-Federalists." So on the Federalist side, you have James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. Okay, on um, they like the federal government. And remember again, federal equals central equals national. That is all the same thing. Okay, they're not going to ask you, do the federalists like the federal government? That's too easy. They'll ask you, do the federalists like the central government or do the federalists like the national government? Okay, so federalists, national, and central all mean the same thing. So they like the federal government. They like the Constitution. Okay, they want to pass it. They do not like the Bill of Rights. Okay, so that's the Federalist side. The Anti Federalists are Patrick Henry, George Mason. And Thomas Jefferson. Okay. They do not like the federal government. Okay. They do not like the Constitution. They like the Bill of Rights. And they like state government. Okay, and that's just, it's two sides of an argument. These people say, adopt the Constitution. These people say, no, write a Bill of Rights. Okay, and in the end, what we get is a Constitution and a Bill of Rights. 
it's another one kind of why not both, okay? So these guys get a little bit something they want. These guys get a little bit something they want. It's called capitalize, meeting in the middle. Okay, so let's check Federalists and Anti-Federalists off our list. Um, George Washington's big thing was not taking sides. He didn't. He supported the Constitution and he thought that we should adopt it, but he would not take sides in this argument. He would not declare himself a Federalist or an Anti-Federalist. He believed that he had a, a duty to the country to be a uniting factor and not a dividing factor. So... He's kind of an interesting guy. We don't talk about him right now. We're going to talk about him after Christmas break. We're going to spend like three weeks just talking about George Washington. I think it's really two. But um, right now, he's just sort of hanging out, being a part of it, there to do his job. But he's not really taking sides. He is president of the convention, but he mostly is just like, now it's your turn to talk. You're done talking. Now it's your turn to talk. Okay, let's vote. How many of you for it? They write down 17 people approve of it. 20 don't, it fails. Who's what's next? What's the next argument? He just keeps things running as president, okay, of the con of the convention. All right, so next is flip rocks. Guys, this is a doozy, the principles of government. You need to look at your index card right now and make sure that your flip rocks is labeled principles of government. Because in the question, what they say is, which principle of government does blank? Or blank and blank represents which principle of government. So that phrase, principle of government, um, principle of democracy, democratic principles, that word principles is your clue, your flashing neon light that says it's one of these seven things and that's it. Okay, so if <laughs> they ask which principle of government um says that different branches of government should have different powers, you should not be like 1787. Okay, that's not a principle of government. That's a date. All right. So there's seven principles of government. And the acronym we try to get you to remember is FLIP rocks without the O. Okay, so FLIP RCS. Okay, FLIP RCS. The first one is federalism. And our image for federalism is the triangle and without a K. That's true. We got some kind of spelling geniuses up in here remembering rock is spelled with a K. All right. And that talks about how the federal government is on top, the state government is in the middle, and then the local government. Okay. And there's two things to remember about this. This is most related to Amendment 10 from your mini constitution. And it's the only one that talks about states. Or states' powers, okay? Um, so it's the only one that talks about states' powers. So federalism, it's the triangle, federal, state, and local. And you guys, if you just remember federalism, we write federal, state, and local. You're not gonna write state on any of these other ones. Not a single one of them. So then you need to just keep that in mind that that little triangle goes with federalism. Okay. Our next one, the L, is limited government. You guys have a pretty good handle on this one generally because you've talked about it in sixth grade and you've talked about it in seventh grade and we're talking about it again in eighth grade. It just means that the um, ruler, whoever's in charge, in our case, the president, is not all powerful. Government has to follow the rules. And in this case, the rules is the Constitution, the United States Constitution, not the state constitutions, the United States Constitution. It is the final authority, the supreme law. Okay? So the phrase final authority is the same as supreme law. All right, so there's limited government. I put my little king with his ball and chain. This ties back to the Magna Carta. Uh, so government has to follow the laws. The laws is the Constitution, which is the um, final authority or the supreme law of the land. Okay? That is why, guys, and I say this all the time, that is why when the president is sworn into office and he's standing in front of the nation and he puts his hand 
on the Bible um, and he swears an oath of office, what he swears is not to protect the people, not to protect the country, not to protect the government. He swears to protect the Constitution. That's what he swears to protect. Final authority in the land, Const United States Constitution. Okay. Um, the next one is individual rights. And for that one, we drew our alien. Okay, our alien. Remember, we had our little alien dude from the Declaration of Independence. His name is LLP. But now our alien is also holding a piece of paper that has a 1 through a 10, because that's the Bill of Rights. Okay. So individual rights is the unalienable rights and the Bill of Rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The unalienable rights and the Bill of Rights. Individual rights. Popular sovereignty is the next one. Okay, and that is a ballot box. We always draw that as a little voting box with the word vote on it. Okay, because this is how we show our power. The people are in control or people power. Popular, popular sovereignty, people power. Okay, so people power and we control it by voting. Generally, popular sovereignty references just either voting in general without voting for anyone specific or specifically voting for the president. That's generally how they talk about popular sovereignty. Um, the next one is republicanism. This is one students... Republican. This is one students often get confused with. And the biggest thing I can tell you is if you draw that big REP and republicanism is related to your representative. Okay, and the little picture we draw is there's all these people and they're just like regular people, right? They got like jobs and stuff to do and shows to watch on Netflix. They don't want to be going to Washington, D.C. and reading all this stuff and writing laws about it. So they pick my seventh period. We did, we choose you, Pikachu. So it's we choose you. So they choose someone. We choose you. And it's like a representative. Okay. Like a person, but with a Pikachu tail. Okay. Um, so they choose Pikachu. Yes, because they choose you. Okay. So then they send their representative. Okay. So they send their representative. So again, this is one of the easiest things. Okay. So if you're a very like word person, this will help really quick. Just rep and republicanism and representative. Okay. But then if you're not a word person, and you got all these people and they're choosing their Pikachu representative. We choose you, okay, to go to Washington and make laws. So I'm gonna go make those laws for you. I'm gonna go make those laws for you. We choose you and we send you to go. Okay. Um, next one is checks and balances. And I'm going to talk about checks and balances and separation of powers at the same time. And there's a reason for that. Both checks and balances and separation of powers deal with the three branches of government. Okay, so there's an idea. If you want government to stay Stop, to not get too powerful. Because remember, these are a group of people who are afraid, not afraid, but they don't want to have a tyrannical government. They don't want to have a tyrant in power again. So they think, how can we set up a government that keeps itself under control? Where one part of the government keeps another part of the government from getting too powerful. So we're going to make sure that one part of the government is keeping another part of the government under control. And that's based on the three branches of government. So the first thing you have to know is that there are three branches of government. 
because it really gels. Okay, our government really gels. The first one is judicial. The second one is executive. And the third one is legislative. Okay, so the three branches of government and each one has its own job. And when we look at their jobs separately, that's separation of powers. So separation of powers is looking at their job separately. The jobs that they have that no one else can do that don't necessarily have to do with each other, but their jobs. So the judicial branch's main job is to interpret. The executive job is to enforce. And the legislative is to write and pass laws. Okay. So interprets, enforces, and laws. And there's the E-L line up. Not so much with the J. So a J is kind of like an I. They look a little bit similar. Okay. Enforce means to um, make sure that people are doing it. So the police enforce the speed limit by pulling you over and giving you tickets. If the police choose to ignore everyone who's speeding, then nobody's really going to pay any attention to the law. So there has to be someone there to enforce it. So the executive branch is actually in charge of enforcing the laws. So the executive branch runs things like the um, Drug and Firearms Administration, uh, the um, food and sorry, sorry, it's the Food and Drug Administration, um, the firearms people, uh, ICE, Immigration and Customs. I don't know what, what all of the things are, but they run all of those, all of those offices. Um, they run the Treasury. They run the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, who make sure you're paying your taxes. Um, the Immigration and Custom uh, Immigration people who come and make sure you're following immigration laws. They run all of that. They don't just look at the law. But remember, these people write the law, but they're going to make sure you're following it. So it's their job to make sure that you're following it. I make up the rules. I make sure you follow them. I decide if the rule is okay. I decide if the rule is okay. So I, I make up the rules. I make you follow them. I decide if the rule is okay. Hopefully that helps a little bit. And that's separation of powers. We're going to look at all of their little jobs. Okay, and in general, we encourage you to write separation of powers as three separate little columns, J-E-L, okay? Checks and balances is the job that they do that keeps each other in check, that keeps each other from getting too powerful because we don't want a president who, who has so much power that he just gets rid of the court system. We don't want a legislative branch that gets so tyrannical that they um, make up laws that don't follow the Constitution. So we got to make sure everyone's doing what their job is and nobody's getting too powerful um, or too big for their britches or becoming a tyrant. We don't want any tyrants, okay? I'm sorry, Rain. Maybe they'll save you some. And, you know, you can bring me one tomorrow, all right? I'll forgive you for not including me right now. Okay, so in general, when we think about checks and balances, we draw um, in kind of a triangle. And you sh you've seen this multiple years in a row now, okay, where um, you have the J, the E, and the L again, because it's all about the three branches, okay, but then they have arrows that are pointing towards each other, so those arrows are pointing towards each other, okay, all right, and basically what it's saying is I have some powers that are going to keep you from getting too, too, too much like a tyrant. And I have some powers that are going to keep you from being like a tyrant. And I have powers that are going to keep you all from being like a tyrant. So everybody is kind of like looking at each other being like, you better not be a tyrant. You better not be a tyrant. You better not. No tyrants. No tyrants. Okay. Um, so that is like checks and balances and we draw for checks and balances we do tend to draw the picture of the the little scales okay and they're balancing power so that everybody all the different branches because these are about the three branches 
all the branches have an equal amount of power. Okay. Some of the major checks and balances. Okay. And just gotta remember, um, tyrant is a ruler who is cruel and too powerful. So a tyrant is like King George III, who we had a re American revolution against. Okay. Um, the Kim Jong Un is generally considered a tyrant. Adolf Hitler was a tyrant. Tyrant. So it's a ruler who is um, overly controlling and a dictator and says, everyone has to do what I have to do, what I say to do, and you have no freedom at all. That's a tyrant. So we don't want any part of our government to become a tyrant and start taking away our freedom. So in order to keep any part of our government from getting too powerful, we create this system of checks and balances where all the different parts of the um, government are getting to check and, and balance each other, okay? So um, some of the major ones are appointing judges. So if you're a judge on the U.S. Supreme Court and you die, then the executive is going to get to replace you. But the legislative branch gets to approve who the executive picks. So if I'm president and Rain is on the Supreme Court um, and she decides she wants to go on vacation and she leaves forever and she's done with being, I need to pick a new one. Oh, okay, I'm going to pick Leanne. Well, now the legislative branch has to interview Leanne and make sure she's right for the job and approve her before she begin, can become, yes, super play, a tyrant is an unlimited government, before she can become a judge. So that's checks and balances. Everyone's part of this system. So if we're replacing a judge, it's going to have to deal with checks and balances. OK, um, another one that's uh, actually in process right now is the process of um, impeachment. So we in, in your constitution, you can look up how if the executive or the judicial branch isn't doing their job, then the legislative branch can start this impeachment process and everybody's involved in this process. OK, everyone's involved in this process. Um, and then um, another common one is the veto, all right? This is if the legislative writes a law and the executive doesn't like it, he can veto it. He can say no and send it back, okay? And then they can actually override the veto if they want to. So this is just some of the more common checks and balance powers right here. Those are some of the more common checks and balance powers. All right, so... All of that's done. That's a big one. I'm going to be honest. That takes up, like, that. that's all that stuff we just talked about. It's half of one of my sides of the card. Civic virtue is a definition. All you should have on your card is a definition, and it literally just means being a good citizen. Civic virtue is being a good citizen. Going to jury duty when you're called to jury duty. Voting. Um, picking up litter off the ground, be a good citizen. Okay. Um, founding documents is my, so that's, that's all civic virtue is. Okay. I'm just going to check that off. Check. Founding documents. I'm actually just going to show you this because I've already got them. So here's our tree. Way back in your spiral on some page. You drew the tree of liberty. Okay. And I'm going to find my tree of liberty. Oh, here it is on page 34 for my classes. The tree of liberty. And on the tree of liberty, we see all of these documents that we have talked about multiple times that have appeared on multiple tests. And from these documents, we get the ideas that lead us to the DOI which leads us to the AOC, which leads us to the constitution and that's representative government. So that's just, it's just this tree. That's what you need with the founding documents. Remembering that this tree and these documents and these, these are the ideas that grow into our US constitution that grow into our representative government. All of this is leading us here. All of these ideas are leading us to the constitution, okay? So the tree, um, the founding document stuff is stuff we've learned before. It's been on three tests in the past. 
So you've got this. Just make sure you, you go over your tree again. And then my last thing is grievances. And I got six minutes, so I'm going to try and hurry here. Grievances. Now, we didn't... We talked about this when we were doing notes in our tiny United States Constitution, okay? And I actually pointed out to you several grievances that were um, in that United States Constitution. But remember that a grievance is something that we were angry about when we dumped the idiot, okay? In 1776, when we dumped Great Britain, we listed out all the things we were angry about. Well. When you are dating someone and you have a list of things that um, you don't like about a person, okay, you have a list of things you don't like about a person, then when you dump them and you date someone new, you're going to pick someone who doesn't have those things you don't like. So if you're like, I really hate the fact that you wear purple, I hate purple, why, why do you wear purple all the time? The next time you date someone, you're going to date someone who does not wear purple. And that's the idea with the grievances being fixed in the Constitution. Okay? So in 1776, thank you, Rain, um, you have the gr angry grievances. And then in 1787, they're going to be fixed in the Constitution. Okay? So it's an angry G to a happy C. All right? And... Um, that, I think I actually put that image on my card. Yeah. Okay. And so just, um, angry G to a happy C. And some of the major grievances were taxation without representation. Uh, just kind of um, taxation without representation, quartering of soldiers, and um, oh, un unfair trials. Okay, and we're going to fix these things. And how do we fix them? Well, we fix taxation without representation by giving Congress the power to tax. So that's taxation with representation. So only the people we are as our representatives can tax us. Okay, so that's taxation with representation. And the quarter of soldiers, we fix that in Amendment 3 which isn't even fancy. It literally just says no quartering of soldiers. Okay. And amendments five, six, and seven are all about fair trials. All about fair trials. So we, all these things we're angry about, we fix in the Constitution. So all these things we're angry about, we fix in the Constitution. All right. Guys, I have literally two minutes. We have finished our checklist. I'm going to show that to you one more time. Make sure that you have on your index card everything that appears on this checklist. Okay? So this checklist is the things that should be on your index card. These are all the topics that we cover on the test. Okay? And you guys, copying my stuff is it, you just want to make sure you understand what you're copying because we're not going to necessarily use, you guys know in the test, the wording isn't going to be the exact same. I might write federal on my card, but then the test is going to use the word central or the word national. I might word, use the phrase taxation without representation, but then the test might be all like um, levying taxes without um, congressional uh representation. So they add words, they make things sound different. So when you're writing what you're writing on your index card, make sure you're really thinking about what does it mean? What other words might they use to make the sound fancier? Okay. Ordinance is the law. Take the land and turn it into a state. All right.
Um, remember, national, central, and federal are all the same thing. Uh, look over your test that we took last week. Okay, see what you got wrong. Make sure you're prepared to not get it wrong on the test tomorrow. Okay, and it is 7.30, so I have to go. We have been on for an hour. Feel free to review the um, video at your leisure. Use your strategies tomorrow. Make sure your index card is ready to go and that you can read it. Okay, Rain. Um, I will post, I have a video of me going over this quiz. I will also post that on my YouTube site. Okay, so I will post this video on my YouTube. And I have this video and I have a video of me making this. And I have a video from yesterday when I was at Disney World. I made another video. So there's a lot of videos. You have the Quizlet. Use your resources. All right. See you all tomorrow.